Okay, so um, this is the second lecture for um, Computer Concepts 3, and I'm going to cover the second and third objectives in this one. So it'll, even though there's three sections in the reading, there'll only be two videos. Uh, it's because, as you'll see, this uh, section right here is going to go really quick. So we're going to look at um, input and output devices and a little bit about how to install computer hardware. Okay, so... Um, this should be pretty simple and straightforward if you think about it. This is just looking at input devices. So um, we've all used a keyboard. Uh, it should be uh, pretty obvious that's an, that's an input device. There are a couple that you might have used. Uh, definitely used a mouse, probably. A touchpad, depending on if you have a laptop that has a touchpad or, or a, um, some, it also has a, some of them, the Lenovo's have a little push point or a little push pen there. Um, which is similar to a kind of a mouse or a touchpad. And, um, and there's a trackball. Trackball looks like something you see on a video game. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen a computer with a trackball in a long time, um, but there are other, other um, computer-like devices that will use kind of a trackball uh, type piece. And then a touchscreen or a multi-touch screen, that's kind of like most people's phones. Um, so again, these are all just input type devices. Uh, here's a couple others that you might have seen. Uh, stylus or digital pen if you have an iPad uh, um, you might have an Apple pencil um, if you have a Samsung phone sometimes it comes with a uh, little bit of a stylus uh, that slides into the side of the uh, phone um, microphones input device cameras webcam scanner if you want to scan documents in um, and then just a, a series of different game controllers which I probably would put a trackball in a game controller so a joystick a game pad, the dance pad, if you're going to do that dance, dance revolution, which of course you'll never catch me doing. Uh, some type of wheel, the old um, iPads used to have kind of a wheel that you could use your finger to spin. Um, and then even some type of motion sensing controllers. Uh, not necessarily with respect to uh, computers, but you can do like a photo, a photo cell so that if you, um, if you come between you know, kind of like you wave your hand in private, it could indicate that um, something's happened and create an input to um, uh, things like that. So those are all input devices. And um, I think you just wanna think through where you would probably use them and what you use them for. Again, these are the standard ones, keyboard, some type of mouse, maybe a touch screen. These ones are a little bit more specific to uh, what you're going to be using. But think of it, all of these allow you as a user to tell the computer something, um, either by pointing at it or typing a letter or saying a word, um, but it's a way of you communicating information to the computer. The output devices is, is, um, are used for ways to get something out of the computer. So again, just think about it, very logical. Speakers, headphones, you know, um, earbuds, headsets, all these things just get sound output. Projectors, you're going to get a, um, a visual output. So if you play a movie, on your computer, you can project it on a projector or a screen uh, slideshow like this. Voice synth synthesizer, you know, so if you want the computer to talk to you, and again, we talked last time about people with disabilities, this might be one way that the computer could communicate to someone who uh, was blind. It could talk to them. Um, printers, and there's just a, a, a lot of different types of printers in there. Um, um, some of which you might have, like an inkjet you might have at home, that's probably the cheapest one or a multifunction device, which just means it has uh, the ability to scan or copy as well as print. Uh, you might have a mobile printer. I don't know many people have mobile printers. Plotters are printers that you, you could print out like kind of a, a banner or a map, something very, very large. And then a 3D printer, you know, th those are all in vogue. They, they actually create something that's got three dimensions, not only just something flat on a piece of paper, but has a, a depth dimension as well. Um, and there, you'll see more, you're going to see more and more of those as time goes by. And talked about 3D printing like organs and things like that, or a 3D printing pizza. So uh, think about a computer that had the instructions for that, and then the printer has those type of ingredients, and somehow it knits it together and creates something that you know doesn't have to go into an oven. Pretty interesting. Okay, so that was it for input and output. As you can see, why I said this is going to go very quickly. And the last one on here is just going to talk a little bit about installation. So um, installing computer hardware, it, 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 nowadays it's very easy 
Uh, usually if you buy like um, a webcam or a, I have a webcam here and also a microphone, external microphone. And all I did was plug them in to the back on a USB port. And that's referred to, see down at the bottom of the screen, plug and play. You pretty much that's all you do. You plug it in and you can use it. Um, every once in a while, you'll have something that uh, doesn't work that way. Uh, so sometimes if you buy a printer, uh, you can't just plug and play with the printer. You have to actually install a device and uh, a device driver. And a device driver is just a program that um, tells your computer how to work with that particular peripheral. Um, again, it used to come on a, on a CD or a DVD and you just put that in there and run an installation program. But nowadays you might have to sign onto the internet, uh, go to a website, and then you could download a piece of software. But, you know, for the most part, um, you just have to stick it in the back, turn on the computer, and follow the on-screen steps, and usually it works. Again, every once in a while you run the problems, but for the most part, the way things are designed nowadays, they're really focused more on the plug-and-play architecture because it's the easiest for the user. Um, I think um, that's pretty much it for this particular section. So I wouldn't, uh, again, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Uh, you might be asked some questions on uh, what type of output device you might have or what type of input device you might want to use, uh, maybe an example. So I'd go over those uh, in the book. And the book, see the things in, in blue here, those are kind of the areas that are also colored or, or bold in your book. So I would take a look at those as well. Okay, last section, and we're not going to spend too much time on this as well. Um, if you look in your book, there's a whole section on troubleshooting, um, what to do if you kind of run into some issues or problems. And uh, I'm not going to go through all that. You can go ahead and read through that and see if it is. But I'll tell you, mostly the easiest way to check with things is to turn the computer off and turn the computer back on or the, the uh, peripheral device on or off. That usually fixes things most of the time. Um, if you get too far into it, it's probably best to just take it to someone, you know, take it to a store or to like Apple Care or a Genius Bar appointment or something because um, you might be getting well out of your ability to um, figure it out, um, which I will say is the one reason you want to always have good backups of your, of your data just in case uh, you have a problem that's, that's pretty, a pretty bad problem and they need to do something where they basically need to reconfigure your computer and restore it to the way it was before. So we'll talk a little bit about this now, but those are the highlights. So uh, we're gonna talk about measuring the performance of computer hardware, explaining how to troubleshoot, uh, maybe some, uh, some stuff on maintenance, and uh, finish up with something on restoration. So uh, computer performance. Um, now there's three things you can check. So you, know, you, can, you actually can probably, just by using your computer, know if something's wrong. And a lot of it's because people will say things like, my computer is so slow. So when the computer is so slow, there's lots of things that can be behind why a computer is slow. Uh, you can take a look at your processor clock speed, um, and there's ways, there's software that will actually measure your clock speed, and that's the speed at which your computer can execute instructions, okay? So you don't necessarily need to know exactly what that means, but if you get the clock speed, then down below here on the slide talks about something called a benchmark. A benchmark just sets up kind of the standard. So think of, here's a very simple way of looking at it. You have a car and the car is supposed to get 20 miles to a gallon, but you notice that you've been going to the gas station a lot more often to fill up the car. So you start to track how, how much gas you buy, when you buy it, uh, when you fill up again, how many miles you drive, and you determine that you're getting about 12 miles to the gallon. Well, when you bought the car, um, the car dealer told you that based on tests, the average mileage uh, through normal usage was 20 miles. So now you know that it's supposed to get 20 miles, but it's only getting 12. And so when you go into the, you take it into the gas, uh, the, um, the uh, repair shop, and you talk to the guy there and you tell him, hey, listen, here's the deal. It's supposed to get 20 miles a gallon. It's only getting 12 miles a gallon. So now the person has some, ha, knows that something is affecting the miles per gallon, and they can go and look at those things that might might it might be something with um, uh, maybe the way the carburetor is set, or uh, the fuel injector, or a thousand other things that I'm not really familiar with. But the net of it is the benchmark is just used to bet, to compare what your current reading is to determine if you have a problem. Here, here's another one: 98.6 temperature. Do you have a fever? 
Well, you know if you have a fever if you have a temperature that's higher than 98.6. So you use the thermometer to take your temperature, you have a 101 degree fever, you compare that to the benchmark of 98.6 and you go, I have a fever and it looks like I'm about two degrees higher than I should be, okay? So clock speed is one thing you can measure. The other thing you can take a look at is this bus width or word size and that's the speed at which data travels. So um, if, if it's, um, if that's not working too well, or your clock speed is low compared to some benchmarks, then you have some basis for going to troubleshoot what could be wrong with your computer. So here's a, here's a bunch of different problems. And again, if you look in your textbook, there's going to be a thousand. I'm just gonna do one or two. Computer dev device does not turn on. So they, they give you some recommended solutions here. Computer might be in sleep or hibernate mode. Maybe you have to wake it up. Unplug the computer and plug it in. Make sure the power cables are properly plugged into the wall. Make sure the battery's charged. Um, if the battery's charged, connect the AC adapter to try to turn the computer on with the power plugged in. And if something else is wrong, you might have a, uh, might be an issue with the power supply or the AC adapter or maybe the battery. Contact a professional. So troubleshooting is just the process of trying to narrow things down. Uh, so each one of these in the, in the textbook Again, I'll just pick one here. Computer issues a series of beeps when turned on. Refer to your, refer to your computer's documentation to determine what beeps indicate as the computer, computer may be experiencing a problem. So when you turn the computer on, every once in a while it goes beep, beep. That could be a good beep, beep. Could be a bad beep, beep. Um, monitor does not display. A lot of these would be checking cables. Um, verify the monitor is turned on. I mean, these sound ridiculous in some respects, but a lot of time it is a problem if things aren't turned on or properly uh, the cable got loose and it's not plugged in. Um, make sure that you're looking at the right input source for the monitor. Restart the computer. A lot of these go to restart the computer. Um, keyboard or mouse doesn't work. Batteries, you could have, a, if, um, if it's wireless, maybe it's, uh, or it's Bluetooth, it's not connecting. Maybe the Bluetooth's not turned on. Um, can you get another keyboard or mouse and try that out to see if it's uh, something with the computer or something with the keyboard? Can you try the keyboard or mouse out on a different computer? So troubleshooting is just applying kind of a common sense approach to trying to isolate what the problem is. Um, here's what keyboard no longer works. Well, um, if you can try to dry the keyboard out. Speakers don't work. Again, making sure things are connected, making sure the volume is up. Um, they seem simple. Um, now, couple hard drive makes noise. This, this could be a problem. Um, fan contains built up dust. Uh, it doesn't work. Device is too hot. Well, device is too hot is probably because the fan's not working. So you gotta look at the fan to make sure that it's cleared out. Um, make sure the fan is spinning. Sometimes the fan's not spinning. Um, external drive not recognized. That could be a driver issue. Um, it could just be again, unplug it. Plug. I, I sometimes plug in a flash drive and it doesn't see it. It's because it's not seated properly. So I need to pull it back out and just kind of push it in a little harder and wiggle it around a little bit so it's properly seated. Now, um, virus or malware, that could be a bigger problem because um, you might have really downloaded something bad. So this is a good, this is a good kind of preventive maintenance thing to make sure they have some type of virus or malware software installed and that you run it regularly. If you do have a problem with a virus, you can look up on the internet how to get it off or buy, sometimes at that point, purchase some um, malware, malware removal software to go ahead and take it off. Uh, it's, you can usually take it off on your own if you know what you're doing, but the, the buying that software and being preventative is much better. And if you ever do get something, buying some type of removal software, it's usually a lot easier than trying to do it yourself. Um, and again, in any of these problems, if you run into issues, you should take it to a repair place uh, just because you could end up doing more harm than good. Um, slow performance, screen damage, see if anything else on the side. liquid damage, uh, clearly you want to try to soak it out. I'm sure you've all done the rice. Um, if you've dropped your phone in water, I mean, it's not as big as you with phones anymore, but rice absorbs the moisture, so you stick it in moisture for, uh, in the rice for 24 hours to see if the moisture goes away. You also want to get power off of it. Is You don't want power on there because that's what's going to have problems. It will short out. Um, mobile phone reception is more likely um, probably not your device. It's probably something to do with um, uh, where your wireless carrier is. 
but sometimes the case can interfere with it. And sometimes, again, turning things on and off works well. And then finally, printer issues. Printer issues probably happen quite often. And a lot of it has to do with um, maybe not having the right driver, but even as something as goofy as you don't have paper in the printer or toner. So um, all of these, you usually get some type of indicator that's not working um, properly. Maybe you'll get an error. Um, there's really no one simple way of diagnosing these problems. The best way to do is to get kind of good at troubleshooting, isolating the problem, uh, taking some good notes on what exactly is going wrong, and potentially getting to a uh, professional who can help fix the problem. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about really quickly is regular maintenance. Um, you can do this, uh, you, you can clean it with a damp cloth or uh, with a polishing cloth. Cleaning a keyboard with compressed air is kind of helpful because there's a lot of stuff in your keyboard usually and it can interfere with the keyboard working. Uh, the third one there, if you do have, um, laptops are a little harder, a little easier to do, but if you have a desktop and it's jammed up against the wall and you haven't been back there for a while, you might be surprised how much dust is in there and cleaning out the vents with like a Swiffer or, um, or just a hand towel or something will really help get the air flowing. If your computer gets too hot, it can shut down, it can be damaged. So you, this is something, especially if you have, like I said, a desktop software, uh, like one with a tower, you wanna make sure that the thing is clear. Also, when you, when you put the computer someplace, make sure there's plenty of space around it so that you could get airflow. Um, media is free of clean, uh, is clean. So if you do have something like a DVD, uh, a CD-ROM, you wanna make sure that you clean that appropriately because sometimes if it's not clean optically, it won't be read properly. And um, a computer, computer hardware usually does better in cooler environments. So again, if you have a computer tower and you're trying to get it out of the way and you have it jammed to a corner um, with all the cords, sometimes it can heat up. And when things heat up, electronics don't like to be too hot. They need to be cooled. Um, two real quick things about a UPS and a surge protector. Um, if you plug something directly into the wall um, and for some reason your light, your uh, house gets struck by lightning and or there's a surge in the electrical grid and you get a little bit back, um, kind of a back lash of power, um, you, could, um, you could fry your computer. So the one thing that you want to do between your computer and the wall is use a surge suppressor or surge protector. All that happens is it, it's got a, um, it, it, mostly they're on also on um, these power strips that you get, but you got to make sure that has a surge protector on it. Uh, usually it uh, might even say like one or two plugs have the surge protector and the others don't, uh, but usually there's a little bit of an inline fuse. So if you have some type of surge, the inline fuse breaks which basically means your power, your power strip goes, but it stops it from getting to your computer. Um, a, a UPS is kind of like a surge suppressor, but it's also got a battery backup. So if you have a laptop, you kind of have a UPS already in your laptop, because if the power goes out, it just kicks the battery on. But if you have a desktop, you usually don't have a, a backup battery. So um, in addition to wanting to put a surge suppressor on there, if you get one that also has a a uh, UPS on it. It just means it has a battery that's charged. And if you lose power in your house, um, the computer will just keep on running. And again, very important if you're working on something and you haven't saved, it's miserable to do work for an hour or two and not save and then have it all get lost because you lost power. So these are two things that you should consider um, whether or not you have a desktop or a laptop, but worth consideration. Um, I already talked about uh, keeping clutter away from it. You just don't want things on top of your computer, because again, it adds to the heat and stress. Um, regularly backup data, I can't say that enough, regularly backup data, um, and then use protective cases for media. That just means be careful with your flash drive, you know, throw it in your pocket, throw it in, in, in your backpack or purse or something. Just be careful because you're exposing the end of it and it gets damaged, then it's going to be impossible to get the information on that off. So be sure you're doing, if you're doing a DVD or CD, that's obvious too, you wanna to use like a jewel case. But again, people aren't using those nearly as much as they used to. And um, the last piece here, restore, restoring. Restoring just means you're going back to a place um, from, set, from a day or an hour ago. So some, um, if you have an iPhone and you have an iCloud account, you might do a regular backup every night. If your phone breaks, when you take it into the Apple store, uh, they'll say, when's the last time you did a backup? And if you have these automatic backups, it might be as of midnight the day before. 
So if they need to restore your device, you'll get everything back from the last backup. So let's say it did, you know, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you backed up midnight of that day or 1201 of the day. And sometime during the day, your phone breaks. Well, you can restore back to 1201 of that day, but anything that happened from 1202 on to 3 p.m. when your phone broke, uh, you'll lose. So um, it's good to have kind of regular backups. Usually if you lose a day, it's not that bad. Um, but when you do a, a backup, again, I think the phone, a lot of people probably done with phones because phones are more easily damaged. Um, but you, you could lose your photos, you could lose your email, you could lose your contacts, you could lose your messages. Um, so that's why I think Apple is a pretty good job hawking um, iCloud and some autom automatic backup services. But the same thing applies to your PC, your laptop, your desktop, is that you wanna be doing regular backups because if you do have a problem, especially let's say in the middle of the semester and you've been working on a research paper or some other project and you lose the whole thing and you haven't backed up anything, you know, you could be coming down to the wire and you'll have no backups or you'll have no way to restore that. So again, make sure you do backups and when you do a restore, again, usually you can put something in restore mode and it'll, it'll walk you through a process of taking you back to some factory basic uh, level and then you can restore from your backup once that's the, the underlying operating system has been and um, reinstalled. Okay, I think that's it. And, oh, I guess I got one more. Display issues. Um, yeah, the thing you wanna just look in here is if you have a display issues and, and you're going through this process, you wanna again, look, try a monitor on a different system to isolate. So if, let's say you don't see anything. Hook up your computer to a different monitor if you have one. If you see something, you know it's the monitor. If you don't see anything, they know it's the computer, okay? Uh, it could be a cable, try different cables. Um, if, if, it, if in fact it could be a video card issue in your computer. So let's say you hook it up to a different monitor and you have the same problems. It's probably inside your computer and you wanna look at your video card. A video card is just the card, the hardware inside the computer that, that really works on displaying information. So um, again, if you pull the back off a computer, there's several quote unquote cards in there. Might be one for sound, one for video, there's a master kind of motherboard card that has a lot of your processing stuff in it. You might have some other um, different cards for different uses in there too, one for an, a network card or things like that. Um, you could also look at updating drivers. Remember we talked about drivers. Um, they are the things that help things, you know, these peripheral devices talk to each other. You could get into a situation where you need to update drivers. However, if you're using software, uh, using something and it's set up, usually your system will automatically update those things. You don't have to worry about it anymore used to be much more complicated. Uh, things are much more insulated now. I think that's it. And it is. So um, that's it for um, module three. Uh, we are done with the computer concept modules for, for a couple weeks now while we work on Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint. And we'll go back and have three more computer concepts uh, modules uh, midway through the course. Okay. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, good luck on the exam.